So let's cover a new chapter, okay? very exciting chapter, from inference to training. Okay? Um, we'll talk about distributed training. Right? So usually uh, training deep neural nets are pretty slow and take a long time. In this, in this lecture, and also Thursday's lecture, we are going to learn what are the techniques that can enable us to train neural networks faster. So in this lecture, we will talk about uh, below aspects, what is the background and motivation for distributed training. Okay? And introduce two concepts. One is the uh, data parallelism. How do we parallelize to use more GPUs uh, to train faster? Okay? Two aspects, one is data parallelism, the other is the model parallelism. We either divide the data or divide the model. Divide the model. And we will talk about several distributed communication schemes okay, to enable us uh, to have a, a more efficient communication across different nodes. Uh, in the first half of the lecture, we are just assuming a single device for inference. But now we have a lot of devices. They have to communicate with each other. So communication schemes matters. Okay? So let's start the journey by first talking about the background. What is distributed training? And why do we need that? Uh, first of all, before I get started, I want to Seek your answer. What is um, the scenario where, in your research or in your uh, your um, daily um, job or research, have you ever used any distributed training scenario? Um, I interned at Facebook on the AI team, so the data sets are in sort of the trillions of rows. So in order to train any sort of neural net on it effectively, it was definitely taking place across distributed. Right, trillions of data, so a lot of computation required. Definitely we cannot fit everything into one node or even one GPU. So we need a lot of nodes. Yeah. Um, I was uh, cramming for a final project because I didn't like budget my time well. But since I like, trained the distributed, I was able to just pick the best one and just use that one. I distributed pick the best one so that each one can train faster. Yeah. You can collect more. Okay, that's a good point. All right. So um, as we have seen this figure many times, you know, higher accuracy model usually means we have a lot of computation. And today these models are getting super big. Uh, for example, this uh, GPT-3, okay, uh, that contains 170 billion parameters. And even training this model um, uh, require um, it is crawled across 8 billion web pages, right? require 3 million GP hours if you use just one single GPU, right? So that's probably too long. Therefore, we want to increase the number of GPUs and decrease the hours. So here's a breakdown of several popular models from vision to natural language, okay? from vision models to this bird, uh, Turing NLG, and GPT, uh, GPT-3 models, okay? And this is the number of parameters all the way up to 170 five billion parameters, okay? And this is the training hours. Rather than 50, it's relatively affordable, like roughly one day, a little bit more than one day on this a 100 GPU, okay? With proper, better library, probably we can do it uh, within one day. But with those super big models, um, the computation requirement and training hours become super long, right? And how do we make it faster? So, uh, Deep neural nets are notoriously difficult to train. And this is a quite interesting. The boss asked you, what did you do last month? And he said, I trained the model for one epoch. Oh, okay, fine. What's your plan for the next month? Okay, uh, we're going to train the model for one more epoch. So productivity is limited. Right? So we want to definitely improve that. Um, so actually, we want to show you a real world example in our lab for distributed training, how we can accelerate that by using more computation. Okay? So um, if training takes 10 GPU days, you can use uh, 1,000 GPUs, right? you can possibly uh, finish that in only 14 minutes, ideally. Right? If you divide the time by the number of GPUs. Um, so let's see a real world use case. So we've been using the Summit supercomputer right? to, train a lot of, uh, to train on a lot of videos, okay? to train this temporary shift module video recognition model. So the summit computer, uh, supercomputer, uh, each node can, contains six V100 GPU um, and 512 gigabytes of memory. So we can possibly fit the data set locally 
um, in memory. Okay? Um, and it's, it's connected by high speed infinity band network, okay? super fast. And we train this vision model uh, over 600, uh, 660 hours of videos. Okay? Um, initially, just using one node that takes two days for us to train. Okay? So, initially, one node is taking 49 hours and 15 minutes to train the model. This is the accuracy for this action recognition, recognizing what you are doing, action recognition. Um, with 128 summit nodes, so that's um, 70, some more than 700 GPUs, we can uh, reduce the training time to only 28 minutes, so uh, similar accuracy. But we, when we scale it to 1,536 nodes, okay, we can reduce the time to only 14 minutes. With almost no degradation about the accuracy, right? So we basically turn something uh, that required two days to train. Now it's only a couple or over a time of uh, coffee time, right? Only 14 minutes we can complete the training. So hopefully this gives you enough motivation why we need distributed training and what we can achieve with such techniques. So let's talk about some distributed training basics. Okay? What are the uh, basic techniques? So I'm going to introduce data parallelism, model parallelism, and compare the advantages and disadvantages of these two parallelism. Okay, so let's brainstorm a little bit. Right? We have a huge model, a pretty big machine learning model, contains billions of parameters. Okay? And secondly, we have a huge amount of data set, hours of, of many hours of videos, or even millions of web pages of text. How are, uh, what are the possible ways to uh, parallelize um, these models and these data? And how can we uh, train it faster? Each GPU trains a different batch of training data mm -hmm. Right, so we can, first of all, on each GPU we train different batch of data set, right, so here. Here we color the data set into three different colors. GP1 trains on this blue image. GP2 trains uh, a green batch. And GP3 can train on this yellow batch. Right? That's a good point. Right? So this is data parallelism. Okay. We are distributing um, the images across different GPUs or different nodes. So different node, they share, they are training on the same um, piece of uh, uh, we have the same model, right? Same model, but different data. Right? Just distribute the big data. Okay? So this is called data parallelism. We split the data set into different chunks, and each GPU has to a particular chunk of them. And they share okay, the same model across different devices. Okay? And there's another uh, mode which is called model parallelism. So rather than uh, dividing the data into several chunks, we can also divide the machine learning model. Okay, so say this is a super big model that have, um, has four stages. We can uh, split the model across different GPUs. Okay, so using a single copy of data, um, but uh, pass the first chunk of um, neural network to GPU-1, the second chunk to GPU-2, and the last chunk to GPU-N. Okay? So in this way, each GPU is responsible for a portion about this pipeline. So what is the potential issue uh, when we are trying to divide, uh, divide, the, mod up, divide the model in this way? Uh, you can be bottlenecked if one GPU is really slow. There'll be this like, basically coverage of throughput. Yeah, exactly. Say so they depend on each other, right? In order to finish the whole training, all the GPU has to finish um, at, at, the, at the same, right? So if GPU two is super slow, or we allocate a super large chunk, or if this chunk is uh, taking a lot of computation, it's hard to load balance. Right? Okay, so uh, this is the animation. We just divide divide the model, different chunks of the model to different GPUs to parallelize them. Okay. And now let's compare the advantage and disadvantage of this data parallelism 
versus this model parameter. Okay. So data parallelism, we split the data. Well, the model parallelism, we uh, split the model. Okay. And for data parallelism, we have the same model okay, and replicate that across different devices. Well, for, for model parallelism, we have to move the activations okay, to get the output of the first uh, GPU will be the input of the second GPU, so we have to move those activations. Um, for data parallelism, it's relatively easy to parallelize. So for image, we can crop them, resize them to the same size, same dimension. So the workload across different GPUs are roughly similar. Two images for GPU 1, two images for GPU 2 in this figure. Okay? But um, model parallelism is hard to parallelize because different parts of the model might contain different number of parameters, different drops. Um, it's hard to do load balancing. And um, data parallelism uh, require, uh, requiring copying the model by n times if you have n GPUs. Okay? So there's some redundancy. Uh, this one will fail if the model is so big. Right? Even one GPU, uh, you cannot fit the entire GPU. Right? Um, so that will require uh, this model parallelism when you have to divide the model into several chunks and each GPU will be responsible for only one chunk of the model. How do you synchronize backpropagating the gradients when you do data parallelism? Like it seems like if one of them finishes and wants to do the backwards pass, do the others just have to wait until they're done and then do the backwards pass with that one's gradient? Or? Right, so there's synchronous training and there's also asynchronous training. The one they used is the synchronous training where um, different GPUs get allocated with different chunks of data, but they are of the same size, the same workload. So the flops, um, the workload they get allocated is roughly is exactly the same. But you know, um, computers they, they have different, um, um, they may be different, they may, may differ a little bit. Some may complete the job earlier. Some of them may get stuck in the middle, contact switch, etc. So the slower one has to wait for the uh, faster one when they are doing a synchronization. And later people uh, uh, try to challenge uh, this assumption and uh, experimented with asynchronous training and find actually asynchronous training also make the model can converge even without synchronization. So that's the magic for deep learning. You can pull the model, you can relax the synchronization, you can relax all sorts of things like international computer science is assuming that something mandatory, but actually a lot of requirement is not mandatory. Sometimes we even find, actually in the next lecture, we can remove, we can pull, aggressively pull those uh, gradients and throw away those gradients. We can also take those stale gradients, like the gradients coming from two or three iterations ago. Um, so for using those techniques to uh, 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 relax for the uh, bandwidth requirement and also tolerate the long latency. All right, so next section we are going to talk about um, in more detail about this data parallelism. Okay, so understanding the distributed training workflow and system design challenges. Okay, so uh, this is the basic setting for distributed training with data parallelism. Okay, so we can scale um, the training across multiple uh, machines. Okay? Each machine may have four or eight GPUs, okay? and each of them has a private copy of data. And we have a centralized parameter server in which the central controller for the whole training process. Okay? So this is just one of the possible setup with a centralized, uh, centralized setting. Then we are also going to talk about this decentralized setting. Okay. So there are two different roles in the framework. We have the primary server, okay, who is responsible for receiving the gradients okay, from the workers, and also send the aggregated weights to each uh, worker. Okay. And we have several workers. They are responsible for computing the gradients using this local copy of the data set, okay, and send the gradient to the centralized server. And 
here we make it uh, animation uh, to have an overview of this infrastructure. Okay, so we have a neural network model uh, of readings on the parameter server, a centralized uh, uh, centralized parameter server. And then we have four workers in this example. Okay? So we have a pool of worker nodes. Each can compute their local gradients. They have a local replica of, about this neural network model. Okay? And they have, uh, each of them has uh, the same um, amount of training data. Okay? So we split in this training data set equally by four chunks across these four workers. So to begin with, we replicate and pull uh, from this parameter server and pull the uh, parameters of the neural network to each worker. Okay. We uh, have replicated exactly the same neural network model. Say if it is ResNet 50, then we have like 25 million parameters. So each model, uh, sorry, each worker has exactly the same copy of these 25 million parameters. And now we are dividing a training data set, say we have one million images, like an image net, one million images. Then each node gets a quarter million images, right? A quarter million uh, images as its training data. And then each node is going to compute the gradient over these 25 million parameters on its own training data and calculate a local gradient. And then it's going to push the gradients to the uh, centralized parameter server, sum up. Uh, the parameter server is going to sum up um, all the gradients, and then update uh, this global model okay, using um, the, the, sum, uh, the weights that has just been collected and summed up. The next is going to uh, replicate, and, and uh, each node is going to pull um, an updated copy of the uh, neural network model from this parameter server. And then we are going to just repeat this step. Okay, replicate the model across different workers, split the training data, and then compute the gradients on each, on each node, and then uh, push the, uh, the gradient updates to the centralized parameter server, sum them up, and update the global, uh, global model. So this is the setting uh, for data parent. Uh, if we uh, look at the pseudo code, uh, this is a single node training scenario, right? We sample a subset of the data, compute the gradients over this chunk of data, and then uh, perform this gradient update, W minus uh, learning rate times the gradient. For distributed training scenario, we added two lines. So for each worker, we have the first pull the gradients, uh, pull the weights from the parameter server. Okay? Pull the weights from the parameter server, and then sample the data from the data set, compute the gradients using its own uh, local copy of the, uh, the weight, and then push the gradients to the parameter server. So for uh, a couple of workers, it's probably fine, but if we have a huge, um, a, a huge amount of workers, okay, a super big uh, amount of workers, um, the communication overhead will be uh, quite large. Okay. So the bandwidth requirement for this parameter server grows linearly with the number of workers. Right. So imagine you have n, work, uh, n workers, you have to collect n copies of of data. Right. So what, that's why the bandwidth requirement actually grows linearly with the number of workers. So let's um, use a uh, pencil to, to calculate what, what is exactly required for a simple example using resident 50. Right? So resident 50 has about 24.4 million parameters. Okay? So how many megabytes is that? Each parameter contains four bytes assuming 32-bit, right? so that's requiring roughly 97.5, about 100 megabytes uh, of storage. So that's the number, of, uh, the size of the weights. What is the size of the gradient? 
but needs to be signed and received in this case. So we have at least a model of weights. What is the size of the weights? Yeah, basically the same, right? The dimension of the gradient is exactly the same as the gradient as the, as the weight. Right? So we have to send and receive roughly 100, 100 megabytes uh, in every iteration. Right? So with uh, a batch size of 32 on this uh, target high, we view it takes about three iterations per second, right? So Modifying them together with 256 nodes, imagine we have 256 nodes connected to the centralized parameter server. How much uh, communication bandwidth do we, do we require? Just modify them together. Right? We have to uh, uh, receive and send and receive across 256 nodes okay? three times per second. Okay? And each time we have to communicate about roughly 97, roughly 100 megabytes. Okay. Modify them together, uh, all down to 73 gigabytes per second of communication bandwidth. That's actually pretty huge. Given uh, the amount of infinity back, uh, the bandwidth is, uh, I speak of like 25, 12.5 gigabytes per second. This is already um, very high end networking infrastructure. Okay. Um, so we do need uh, to perform distributed training without this centralized server. Right? And we have to decentralize uh, this training across different nodes and, and reduce the bandwidth requirement. Otherwise, the centralized parameter server will soon become the bottleneck due to limited communication bandwidth. Okay. So how do we achieve that? So let's talk about uh, distributed communication primitives and talk about how do we get rid of the centralized parameter server and purely do the training in a decentralized manner where um, just before we dive down into details, so uh, let's first uh, brainstorm together how can we get rid of this parameter server and is it possible to do something um, in a decentralized manner? two minutes to think about it. Feel free to propose some new ideas. If you look at this figure, parameter server versus seven workers. Now we don't have this parameter server. And how do we still keep this overall system uh, updated? Okay, I'm done. This is my gradient. Feel free to grab my gradient. Yeah, that's one one way of doing that. Everyone just broadcast. Um, I was gonna say that we can like everyone tends to like a few neighbors that like in some to that like it goes in some order to that like one server is saying that every single thing like that because I think if every node broadcast is gonna have the same bandwidth problem, so you yeah. probably don't. You probably only only want to like. Send to one or two other servers. Yeah, that's a very smart uh, improvement. Rather than broadcasting uh, one to everyone else, we just selectively maybe just broadcast to my neighbors. And my neighbor can talk to his neighbor, or her neighbor, or his neighbor. And then soon everyone gets broadcasting. Right? Yeah. Uh, do you broadcast it to all the nodes that are a layer below across all the devices? Oh, that's a hierarchical setting, right? You can, set a hierarchy, say like in our classroom, uh, we have three rows of students, and first row one, uh, these four students communicate with each other, exchange the gradient, and then row two, exchange the gradient, and then row one, communicate with row two, row two, communicate with row three, so, you know, in such a hierarchical manner, and that's another good option. Yeah, and I think it's actually a, a mean max degree and mean degree problem, so in this, 
uh, topology, the max degree in this graph will be n, n minus one. And you want the, the, the degree in this topology to as average as possible. So you can use a ring uh, to just uh, to store all the weights and uh, when a node computes uh, the uh, gradient of its neighbor's uh, weight, it can broadcast the, uh, the gradient to its neighbor. Uh, setting up in a, a ring-based manner, yeah. so that we have uh, uh, so every only two neighbors. To, to, only two, two out bounds. Uh, two out bounds. Yeah, there are ways to do that. In a ring only is and uh, one, another way I was thinking was uh, to divide uh, a set of all nodes into different clusters. And uh, for each of the, those, you can do a uh, different uh, strategy, say a majority voting to update a uh, node with less frequent, uh, like global, you can update them uh, less frequently, such that uh, you can, you, you won't have the uh, overall gradient uh, over. Oh, so not right. update all the, uh, select all the gradient traffic, but selectively pick some of the more trustworthy ones, assuming some of the machines are uh, more faulty than another, and you can selectively, that might be helpful for the heterogeneous setting, where we have both old GPUs and also new GPUs in the setting, and old GPUs tend to be laggy and sometimes more faulty, so you can do those types of consensus mechanisms. Yeah, those are super good ideas. So let's see um, what we offer in the lecture. So let's first introduce several communication primitives. Primitives are basically the fundamental operations. So point-to-point uh, -point communication, which is the simplest. This one talk to, uh, talk to another, like node zero, talk to node three. I want to send something from node zero to node three. Okay. And we have this receive. Um, primitive, which is just receiving something from node 3 to node 0. So this is point to point. Okay. Um, I've implemented in socket MPI, of NCC a lot of frameworks, okay, as a bit one of the basic primitives, just point to point, uh, send and receive. We also have this collective communication um, primitives, which is uh, scatter and gather. Okay. Say I have uh, five, uh, I have four apples, four apples. I want to distribute one apple one to the first kid, and apple two to the second kid, and distribute uh, uh, one apple to each to each kid. So uh, each kid has one apple. Okay. And we can also gather. Right? So uh, after they eat the apple, they have some probably some um, gather their um, maybe their feedback. Right. So you can formulate a, uh, a array. Uh, number zero is coming from node zero, um, element one is coming from node one, and the two is coming from node two. Okay, so in this uh, mechanism, uh, we can use scatter gather uh, operations to either uh, disseminate some of the uh, what you array or uh, collect the array from different parts. So very similar to gather, we also have this reduce. Um, primitive, which is very helpful. Okay. So different from gather, okay, let's take a look at gather. Um, we just um, collect each uh, element okay, from different nodes and put them together as a, as a new tensor. Okay. So different element of uh, the tensor coming, is coming from different nodes. But in um, this reduce operation, we not only collect uh, those uh, elements, but also we want to sum them up together. Okay? Um, so that's why we are write, writing that in this way. Uh, zero is one element, but it's a reduced version. We can either finding the max, we can uh, sum them up together. Okay? So this is the difference between reduce and uh, gather. Okay? We can also do this uh, all reduce operation. So Previously, uh, node zero collected uh, the information from node zero to three, but now we want all the nodes to collect the information from all the other nodes. This is exactly like I uh, just mentioned, right? So each node uh, sends the information to uh, everyone else, and everyone is collecting the information from all the other nodes. Some of some of them up, some some them up together. 
So collective uh, performance communication patterns across all the brokers we reduce is similar together by uh, either averaging or summing during this aggregation. Um, so uh, let's see what type of what type of communication scheme is used. For example, in this replicated pool. Okay, so uh, pulling um, the uh, weight from this parameter server. So what kind of primitive do we need to implement this pool and push? Are we using scatter or gather or send or receive? So we can use this send primitive for um, pulling, right? So we send, uh, the the server is going to send the weights to different workers, okay? and for uh, push and sum, we can use this uh, uh, reduce operation to average from all, all the workers, okay? average from all the workers to this parameter server. So we can use this reduce uh, primitive. That's it. Is the difference between send and scatter that for scatter you're sending like a different message to each of the end nodes that you're sending it to, right. or is it different? Yeah, different. That's, okay, uh, so that's why this is send and not scatter. Right, scatter you have uh, basically for a different component, it's going to be distributed to different to different workers. Mm -hmm. So you have an array uh, divided into four chunks. Chunk zero go to uh, node zero. Chunk one go to node one. That's different. Um, different elements. So it's more like scatter for the data and not the, the model is the send. For send, uh, the data, um, each piece of data is actually different. Well, data parallels and the data is actually different. Right? So here we are sending the model. We are sending the same model from the primary server to different work. So that's why we are using send uh, here rather than using uh, scatter. Scatter, you are scattering different elements. And here we are sending the same model across different workers. And is the main server averaging all the information coming in so that it's not just like overwritten, so that it's like learning from all the information coming in? Uh, it's going to reduce to collect uh, the, the grading from each server right. and to reduce by summing them up uh, and update the model using the average. Okay, so in this case, what is the bandwidth requirement for each node? For the pool operation and also for this sum operation. Assuming we have um, n nodes, n is the number of uh, training workers. For the sake of time, for the worker, right? So we just need to uh, a bandwidth of O1. Since we have only uh, we only need to uh, receive one piece of model, but for the primary server, it is responsible for delivering, for sending um, n copies of the model to each worker. For push and sum, similarly for the worker, I only need to receive one of them, but the primary server needs to handle n servers. So uh, the prime, primary server is clearly the bottleneck for the spendless requirement. So um, we want to perform aggregation without this centralized server, okay? Using this all reduce mechanism. Okay? So exactly like uh, just now uh, we discussed. Um, now we can get rid of the primary server. There's only five, uh, four workers nowadays. There's no centralized server, and um, each node is responsible for sending the node to zero, to node one, to node two, to node three. Okay, and each node, for example, node two is going to use uh, this all reduce uh, this uh, operation so that we can collect the gradient from each of them okay? and finally sum, of, sum them up or average them. So in this case, um, the time requirement is all n. Okay? We have to perform n steps. Okay? Um, and the bandwidth requirement is also all n since uh, each time at each time step we have to send n copies of the model. Okay, so this is the naive all-reduce implementation, which is sequential. Okay? 
four nodes, we have to use four different steps. Okay? So time is long, it's open, but this requirement is also pretty big. Therefore, we have uh, exactly the second approach, which is rather than communicating to everyone else, we can just communicate to our neighbors. Right? So uh, in step one, node zero talk to uh, node one, node one talk to node two, okay? two uh, talk to three, three talk to one. Okay? So um, after that, uh, node zero okay, will have both this green copy of the weight and also the red copy of the weight. And node one not only has its own color, which is yellow, but also has node zero's um, uh, weight. Okay, so that's why we have both a uh, green color and yellow uh, yellow color. color. And um, and after this step, okay, node zero will also get um, red and also blue. So that's why it's having three colors now. And node one now has both this yellow, this green this green and then this red, so it is three colors. And then we do another step where uh, one only talks to its neighbor. Right? So finally, node zero has all four colors, indicating it has success successfully received the information from all different nodes. Okay? The difference for this method is that um, not everyone is talking to everyone else, but one is only talking to its neighbors. Uh, zero is only talking to one, um, and also three. Okay? It's sending to one, receiving from three. Node one is only sending to node two, and receiving from node zero. Okay? So that limited the amount of uh, uh, traffic. So for uh, time stamp, that's still ON, right? since we have to do ON uh, steps. But what is the bandwidth requirement now? It's only O1. Right, since I don't have to talk to all the uh, other uh, nodes, but I only need to talk to my neighbors. Okay? For example, I only need to send from I to I plus one and receive from I plus one to I. So um, the, the bandwidth requirement becomes constant. Even though I'm, I can increase from four nodes to n nodes, I still only talk to my neighbors. Right? So that's why we have O1 bandwidth requirement. Um, okay, so now we have another uh, scene. Previously, uh, for this uh, naive, um, we can also do uh, this uh, or reduce operation in, a, in the parallel manner. Okay, so remember in, in this slide, we are dividing that into four different steps. Okay, each step we serve uh, only one, only one node. Alternatively, we can do this parallel uh, reduce. Okay, so um, in, at the same time, we just use. Uh, all the reduce happen at the same time, therefore we uh, we have O1 uh, time complexity. But however, the bandwidth requirement is bigger, right? So O n square uh, bandwidth requirement, which is worse. So uh, this is a summary um, what we learned so far using Prime Net Server, okay? using uh, which has O1 uh, time complex complexity and peak node bandwidth is also open, which is the bottleneck. Okay. And we also propose this all reduce method as a baseline. Okay. Both of them are slow. And then we can uh, improve that by using this uh, ring all reduce method. Okay. So we can reduce the peak node bandwidth to O1. Or we can use this parallel all reduce that can reduce the time to O1. But um, can we do even better? Right. So let me introduce this recursive having all reduce. Say, currently we have eight nodes, okay, using different color to represent each node. But ideally, we want to have each copy uh, to have all the information across uh, everyone else. Right? So the first time step, uh, each node just exchange with neighbors, okay, with offset of one. Right? So after that, node one has both uh, green and, and red. And similarly, for the remaining nodes, it's two colors since it's exchanging information with its neighbors. Next step becomes interesting. Each node exchange information with neighbors with offset of two. Okay, so in this case, we have green and red, and also red, um, this light red, and also blue. Okay? 
So after that, we have four colors for each node. Right? Like for this one, we have green, red, uh, yellow, and also blue. Right? So green, red, yellow, and blue. We have four colors. Then what shall we do for the step three? three uh, four. Right? So each node exchange neighbors with outside of four. Exactly. Um, so in that case, I'm going to communicate to this node. So this dark color versus this light color, and also exchange information. Where each node has both of uh, actually all eight colors in only three time steps. Okay? So this is a, like a tree structure. In log n uh, depth, I can quickly get all the information from all the nodes. Okay? Doesn't that, um, your bandwidth isn't the same at each step though, right? Like uh, for the first step, to the second step, you're doing twice as much data transmission, right? So, uh, model has been one, two, three, four, right? And here, you can also have one, two, three, and four. Oh, it's not, you're not communicating two tensors in step two, you're communicating, like, that's only one tensor to the very average bit? Yeah, this one, you already averaged that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Would, in the first two nodes of step two, would it not be the same coverage because you're averaging the same? In the which one? These two? Um, in step two. Step two. The ones with the same color. Is, uh, is that not the same value? They are, let me see, this one, this one, they yeah. are of the same value, actually. Right? Since both of them are averaging with each other. They are the same value. Um, yeah. So this is a very smart way, right? So this is uh, making the all reviews ha actually happen, uh, finish within all the end steps. Called recursive having or reduce, also called butterfly, since it looks like a butterfly, a butterfly or reduce. So let's put them here. So using this recursive having, we have all um, log n time complexity and p. Uh, node bandwidth is only O1, right? Since I'm either communicating with my direct neighbor or neighbor with a uh, distance of two or neighbor with distance of four, rather than talking to everyone else. Right. So the total bandwidth requirement is all in, in this case. And this is very widely used method on all this. All right, uh, it's so amazing that we pretty much covered uh, all these uh, four techniques, right, except the last one. So that's very interesting. So far we talked about this um, data parallelism, right? So in several scenarios where we, we might be training a super big model, where even one GPU cannot fit the model. Say, um, a popular model actually we are actually working on is this uh, OPT model for super big language models, right? It, the parameter-wise, it contains 175 billion parameter. So uh, if each parameter is represented by uh, float, float, even by float 16, not to mention float 32, right? So how many uh, storage is required? So two bytes, so 16 bits are two bytes, right? So 175 billion parameters multiplied by two bytes, that's all, all together 350 gigabytes of storage. It's just required to simply store the model, not to mention the, active, the size of the activation, right? So this is a huge chunk of memory uh, storage requirement. So uh, the typical, the largest GPU memory we have on A100, A1, A1, 100 GPU is 80 gigabytes. Okay, so by no means we can fit uh, just the inf even the inference uh, on one GPU for such a big model. Right? So with 80 gigabytes, we need at least um, five. Right? Uh, those GPUs uh, in order just to host uh, to host uh, the uh, the model size. Right? So this is one scenario where data parallelism is not enough, and we have. To parallelize, to divide our our model across different GPUs. Okay? So this is the setup. Okay? Assume we have uh, eight uh, GPUs. Okay? Uh, we are dividing um, the model, the different parts of the model, to different GPUs, okay? and they share the same uh, they share the same data either for training or for inference. So if the total uh, storage requirement is uh, 350 gigabytes. Of uh, 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 so the total size of the weight is 350 gigabytes, then divided by eight cars, each car is responsible for roughly 44 gigabytes of the weight. Okay. 
so that we can uh, be placed and trained successfully on the GPU. So let's see, how do we um, enable such communication across uh, different GPUs? Imagine this is actually not as simple as data parallelism, right? For data parallelism, um, uh, each node for each GPU has a unique copy um, about the whole model, right? So it can do its own thing, uh, its local update. However, for such model parallelism, uh, I only have partial, uh, one fourth of the total model, right? So in this case, I divide the model into four uh, different chunks, okay? So no, zero, GPU zero is responsible for only um, one fourth of the model. So all the nodes have to work together in order to complete one step, uh, step update. Right? So this is the forward, okay, noted by F. On GPU zero, I do F zero. On GPU one, I do F one. Okay? So until, uh, until the last part of this model is completed by GPU three, in this case. So this is forward. And then uh, we have to do the backward, okay? So um, we have to do the, uh, the third chunk on the third GPU, and then the second chunk on the second GPU, okay? So actually, the, from the timeline perspective, okay, we first do the tweaking, uh, first do the inference, to the forward from node zero, and then, and then that handles the, uh, the activation to the node one, and then node two, and then node three, okay? After this forward completes, we do the backward, right? For B3, B2, B1, B2, B0, in the reverse order, since we are doing back propagation. So um, each color represents uh, uh, each node or each GPU, okay? So what is the problem for using this setup to do uh, model parallelism? Think, think about the, uh, the utilization. Uh, each node's doing nothing for the majority of the time? Exactly. So idle, right? So this uh, node zero will be idle for this uh, at this time, at this time, until at the last, uh, last time step. Right? Super low utilization. So if we see that, uh, different layers, uh, forward and backward, and actually all the bubbles means uh, the GPU is being idle for the entire time step. So you have taken 6004 computer structure, computation structures, you might be familiar with such uh, pipeline diagram. Right? So uh, these bubbles is causing the utilization problem. So how do we uh, improve that? So actually, the theoretical utilization is only 25%, which is uh, given. So we can do better by actually um, doing the pipeline parallelism by further dividing the input data into several chunks. Okay? Um, for example, um, we can split a single batch to several uh, micro batches. Um, for example, the original, this is the dimension of the original tensor. Uh, we have a batch size of 16. Now we, we are going to split it by four chunks. So each chunk has only a small batch size of four. Okay? And let's see what happens to the utilization in the new scenario. So as long as um, F0, this is the first GPU, this is the second GPU, as long as the first GPU completes the first chunk of data, right, it can immediately uh, uh, push the activation to the second GPU, so the second GPU can start working on the first batch of data. At the same time, the first GPU can start working on the second batch of data. So in this steady state, uh, GPU zero is working on the, th the fourth chunk of data. And GPU uh, one is working on the uh, third chunk of data, etc. Right. So at this time step, everyone, all the GPUs are busy. Okay? This is ramping up, this is winding down. Okay? And for the back propagation, after um, this is GPU four, completes the uh, last chunk of data, we can start from forward to, uh, to switch to backward, right? And then, uh, as soon as finishes the backward of the, um, this is the first chunk of data, right? This is zero, zero of chunk of data. We can handle the uh, back propagate to the third GPU, and the second GPU, and the first GPU, uh, and so on, right? So 
now we have this overlap, and the utilization becomes higher. Right? You can see the bubbles in this diagram is significantly uh, smaller than uh, less amount of bubbles than the first one. Okay? So we improve the utilization from 25% to about 57% in this case. That's about 2.5x uh, improvement. Okay? So to summarize, um, the solution is to uh, divide the uh, training data into several chunks, okay? so that we can do, uh, we can use this pipeline parallelism to uh, do such model parallelism. So let's do uh, some performance analysis for this method. Okay? K is the different uh, partitions, okay? and M is the number of micro batches. Okay? So K can also mean the number of nodes or GPUs. Uh, we can see that as we uh, increase the, the k okay, from 2 to 4 to 8 uh, in general, uh, as, increase, as we increase the number of GPUs, uh, the speed is becomes faster for both region and also NLP tasks for scenes and transformers. And also if we increase m, okay, subdividing the um, data into s even smaller chunks, uh, the performance also increase, okay, uh, increases the amount of utilization. So with reasonable M and K, there is almost a linear speed up when training uh, transformers. Okay? So with uh, eight nodes, we can achieve a 6.3 X speed up. Okay, so um, beyond the model parallelism, uh, what if um, so far we assume um, each layer can fit uh, the, the GPU memory? What happens if even a single layer can, is too large to fit the memory. Okay? So we need to not only split the model, but also we need to further split the layer. Okay? Even one layer, we have to split it across uh, different um, GPUs to get this tensor parallelism. Okay? So not only this model parallelism, but uh, finer granularity, we have this tensor parallelism. Um, so this is comparing this model parallelism versus tensor parallelism on this computational graph. Okay? Um, so this is the first layer. Uh, we are uh, dividing the model by different layers. Okay? Layer one on the first GPU, layer two on the second GPU. This is the model parallelism we just described. Um, in another scenario, we can further divide uh, the, the tensor. Right? This is the weight tensor. This is the activation tensor. Uh, we can divide them by different two different colors, okay? so we can further uh, make fine-grained parallelism uh, in the tensor uh, tensor's granularity across different nodes. Okay? Uh, blue one is one device; the uh, the red is another device. Therefore, we can have a, a hierarchy of different structures or different parallelism granularity. Okay? We can have either the tensor parallelism, we can also have this model parallelism, and also uh, automatic means we have, we have to ha find an automated approach to determine how do we divide the model into several chunks, right? Ideally, what is the requirement for a good practice of dividing the model or dividing the tensor to improve, good, uh, to improve the utilization? What is a good practice? What is a bad practice? Imagine we have a model that has a lot of computation on this layer, very little computation on the second layer. If we divide in the middle, what happens? Load imbalance. Right? So we want to ideally uh, divide the model or divide the tensor so that each GPU has roughly the same amount of workload. So when we are doing pip pipeline parallelism, um, um, each of them uh, is roughly having the same amount of workload, right? Uh, but do that manually is very challenging, right? So people want to have this automatic approach. So Alpha is a, is a uh, very awesome work that can handle these three dimensions at the same time. For example, um, given this entire pretty big search space, um, uh, the dashed line is actually dividing the, uh, the layers. Uh, chunk one, chunk two into two GPUs. And the different color within the dashed uh, circle is indicating uh, tensor level parallelism. We are further dividing the tensors. 
okay? We can divide two by two versus one by three, or three by one, or two by three this way. Okay? So pretty big in design space. Um, so APA proposes hierarchical space, and first doing this inter-operator parallelism, and then this intra-operator parallelism into uh, hierarchies. Uh, given this example, uh, we can either, we can divide it in many different ways, right? But apparently, is this better or this better? This is better. Each color indicates uh, a different stage uh, will be put on a different GPU. Uh, this one is inco inconvenient because of the communication is twofold, not only here but also here. Yeah, that's one point. The first one is more attractive because uh, the, the uh, interface between the different stages is is more clear. Are there drawbacks for this approach? It looks less balanced. It's a like less soft than an average pool, right? Right. Right, this node might suffer from starvation since it has very little workload compared with this one. Well, the other uh, other argument is that this this approach has uh, two more dependencies, right? So synchronization uh, and communication bandwidth might be larger using this approach compared with this approach. Okay? So we have to search. There's no it's not straightforward to determine which one is better. Each one has its advantage and also disadvantage. So we need a systematic. Uh, search approach to figure out automatically which is a good approach. And also for uh, the intra-operator uh, parallelism, there are many different ways to subdivide uh, this matrix multiplication. For example, we can uh, divide the A matrix, which is the activation, right? B is the weight. We can also divide the weight. Okay? So we divide up complete math model into two parts. Okay? Uh, we can also divide both uh, a and B, and do the outer product. So this blue part will be, will be multiplied by this blue part, get a partial sum, and finally we are going to do it all reduced uh, to uh, to uh, do a reduction about for the different partial sums. So there are also different methods uh, to explore for the um, intra-operator parallelism. So for both intra-operator parallelism. And also this intra-operator parallelism, there's a pretty large design space. So in this work, uh, they propose uh, to do them step by step. First to the inter-operator paths and the intra-operator paths, and have the cost estimation for each of them, and finally propose a, a runtime orchestration. And it's uh, showing pretty good results, showing this, actually matching these manual systems, those carefully designed uh, manual methods for this uh, GPT model up to 39 billion parameters with 64 GPUs. And also compared with um, uh, uh, a different model, actually outperformed the manual baseline by up to 8x for the MOE model. Okay. All right, so let's summarize for today's lecture. Right? So we learned that the basic concepts of distributed training um, models are getting pretty big, uh, many GPU years, if you just use a single GPU. Uh, therefore, we need uh, different parallelism. Okay. One is model parallelism, uh, the other is data parallelism. Okay. We first introduce data parallelism, so for each GPU, it's going to work on, it's going to be training on a different set of training, training data, okay. but they have exactly uh, the same copy of the model architecture. Um, split the data for data parallelism. For another scenario where the model is too big, even uh, when it cannot, even the whole model cannot fit a single GPU, we need to split the model. Okay? Uh, different uh, GPUs is responsible for different part of the model while they are sharing the same uh, input training data. And we discuss about uh, this bottleneck of scaling is basically the communication bottleneck, right? From couple of nodes to many different nodes, uh, the overhead of communication really becomes the bottleneck. And we propose several techniques to remove this communication overhead by using um, 
uh, this uh, decentralized uh, training method, okay? especially such recursive having or reduced manner that can complete um, the uh, reduce in log n steps. Okay? Um, this is this is the training without parameter server. And finally, we talk about this model parallelism and how, how we improve the utilization by subdividing the data into uh, smaller chunks, okay? so that we can use uh, such pipeline parallelism to improve the utilization of each worker. And here are some references. Um, and in tomorrow, or in Thursday's lecture, we are going to uh, talk about other techniques uh, that targets re uh, removing uh, such communication overhead by uh, gradient compression and also delayed update. So we talk about model compression. Now we are going to introduce techniques actually done by our TA Yujun. Uh, he's finding that actually we can very aggressively reduce the communication. Uh, in every thousand gradient, it's enough to only communicate one gradient and throw away the remaining gradients. Or even quantize the gradient only one bit and only communicate one bit. And that's enough convergence. Okay? So looking forward to the next lecture, and that's all for today.